Hello everyone. Good morning. I hope all of you are doing well. If you are able to see me and listen me quickly, give me a confirmation in the chat box. Okay, thank you, Dr. Z, for the confirmation, and uh, I'm hoping that all of it is working well. Now, let us uh, first understand what we have from an academy as an offering. Then I will be explaining to you some of the most important topics that you need to know from ENT. First, we'll, I'll tell you the important topics so that you have the list in front, what you have to study for the examination. Then I'll show you some important images that you definitely have to know before entering the exam hall. And then I'll be doing you some important questions, which you probably have missed up during your entire phase of preparation. So this is my plan. So basically to help you understand what you have not learned or help you understand what you have to focus is what I'm going to do it and do in the current class. So first of all, an academy uh, has the subscription where we have the target next batch and we have got the uh, FMG batch as well. The target next batch is a seven month batch, which is, uh, you know, uh, for only 9,600 rupees. And then you have got the target FMGE batch, which is again a three months batch offered at a very low price of 4,400 rupees. This batch is starting from May 22nd to 26th. If you want to subscribe, you can use the code ENT live and you will get a 10% additional discount on this entire package. We have got the target FMG 2023 batch, especially for the ongoing examination that is probably going to happen in the end of Ju July, 30th of July, which is the tentative date given. So here we are going to have, uh, you know, the 200 hours of recorded content is going to be given. We are going to give you a live mentorship session. We are going to give you doubt solving and high yield MCQs as well. So here you will get, you know, recorded content along with recorded content. You will get the live content from all the top educators and uh, you know whenever you have both of them together in your hand even if you have missed out on one you still have a chance to study along with a mentor during the class so live classes only advantages you are studying in real time with the teacher and hence your preparation is more or less likely going to get completed if you stick to the plan so this is something that we offer to our students and uh, this is something that you should look forward for and the code that again you use is ENT live to get an additional 10 percent off we have got the concise batch where uh, you know now this is for those who are appearing for NEET PG 2024 and this is going to start from 25th of May and the access to this batch is only at a very reasonable price. So here uh, you know this is theory and practice questions. So here it's not just MCQ here you will be doing theory questions plus practice questions and along with that you get a recorded content as well. So now with that, I leave you to the most important topics from ear, from nose and from the throat. Okay, so first of all, whenever we're discussing the must know topics, you should know for sure what are the topics you should focus for. So definitely anatomy of an ear is something that you can expect questions from and constantly you see one or two questions coming from uh, anatomy of the ear. External ear to certain extent you will remember, but it sometimes little confusing when you do the middle year and inner year topics so please do keep a note of middle year and inner year topics and revise that beforehand before you go to the exam then very importantly assessment of hearing and tests for hearing loss is something that you should look forward for and now we have got the neonatal hearing screening program so this is by the government of india so this the sort of question neonatal hearing screening program so what investigation is used for screening once the screening is positive what will you do if the screening is negative what will you do so this is another very very important zone which you will focus on now in external ear diseases of course they are going to have some important topics like the possibility of asking malignant otitis externa has always been one of the favorites they can ask you about simple otitis externa like pharyngulosis or diffuse otitis externa or even fungal infection otomycosis 
so time and again we have seen questions coming from these topics so do make a note of studying at least these and along with that you can also study the herpes zoster roticus or the ramsey hunt syndrome which is another very very important topic for your examination then you have got asom and som which are your middle ear diseases so of course in middle ear diseases you asom is one of the favorite they will ask you about the signs where will you see cartwheel appearance where will you see bulging tympanic membrane where will you see lighthouse sign and pulsatile otoria so these important signs are there in asom along with that the possibility of asking is myringotomy what is the site of myringotomy where will you do the myringotomy what is this incision is it radial or curvilinear all of that questions can come so mainly signs and myringotomy is something that you should expect from asom from SOM, they can ask you about mainly, again, they can give you a clinical image of a tympanic membrane showing you air bubbles and air fluid level. They can show you that there is, they can give you a history of a child presenting to you with, uh, you know, uh, decreased concentration at school, falling grades, not listening to his mother. All of this is features of SOM and then again the question will be what is the treatment or how do you confirm. So how do you confirm is by tympanometry which will show you a B type of graph and uh, you know uh, when you treat you will have to do a wait and watch for three months because it can resolve spontaneously. If it doesn't resolve spontaneously then you are going to do a myringotomy plus what you do is myringotomy plus grome. So this is something that you will have to keep a note of. And the site of incision and the type of incision is going to be different for both of them. So it is going to be curvilinear and antero, uh, posterior inferior quadrant for ASOM. Whereas in uh, SOM it is radial incision in the antero inferior quadrant. So these are some of the important topics from your middle ear. Of course, CSOM with its complication is a very high yield topic. They can ask you anything from the complication. They can ask you about mastoiditis, petrocytis, lateral sinus thrombophlebitis, otitic hydrocephalus. They can ask you about brain abscess. They can give you a radiological image of a brain abscess following cholesteatoma. So they can ask you innumerable number, number of questions from CSOM, cholesteatoma and its complications. Now, otosclerosis, they can give you a clinical history. So, this will be a clinical vignette usually. Whether it is menias or otosclerosis, it will be it will come as a clinical MCQ. This clinical MCQ it will have definitely gradually progressive hearing loss, pregnancy, female, 30 to 40 years of age. And, uh, you know, there is a flamingo pink appearance of the promontory. Then they will ask you about what are the indications of sodium fluoride. So these are some important things that you need to know from motosclerosis. From Menias disease, you very importantly, you should know the symptoms very well. The symptoms are vertigo, sensory neural hearing loss and tinnitus. Now, how is the vertigo? That is also very, very important. The vertigo is sudden in onset, lasting for minutes in hour. Sudden in onset, lasting for minutes to hours, not associated with uh, associated with nausea, vomiting, and vagal symptoms. So very importantly, here you should remember vagal symptoms is something that is a definitely go to for whenever you talk about vertigo. Sensory neural hearing loss is there, but typically low frequencies are affected. So this is another very important feature. Tinnitus, you should remember roaring type of tinnitus. So if you remember this, I think that's good enough for you to answer the questions. Now you can have glomus tumor questions, specifically the signs, rising sun appearance, brown sign, aquino sign, felp sign, salt and pepper appearance. There are all of these signs that you see in glomus. Acoustic neuroma, typically they can give you an MRI showing you ice cream cone appearance. So acoustic neuroma will show you typically an MRI appearance that you should be able to identify. Facial nerve, they can ask you innumerable number of questions. Even the last FMG examination, they had question on facial nerve. You need to know what is UMN, what is LMN, what happens in facial palsy, what are the symptoms, how do you diagnose, how do you treat, what is electroneuronography, what is electromyography, all of that are very important in facial nerve. Now coming to assessment and diseases of vestibular system, it's very important that you know certain tests like caloric test, thick sulfide test, fistula test in assessment part and coming to diseases part, you should know 
very very importantly about bppv meniere's disease perilymph fistula acoustic neuroma labyrinthitis so these five vestibular diseases you should have a comparative chart in my classes i always give them a chart comparing all these five diseases so that they are able to understand and reproduce well now in the recent advances that we have you should know definitely about the rehabilitative methods the cochlear implant this is something that is mandatory to know because nowadays they are asking you questions about rehabilitative methods if there is mild moderate if there is profound hearing loss how will you rehabilitate then you should talk you should know a little bit about instrumentation graft pistons Uh, about lateral cavity surgery, little bit, not must know, but this is something that you can, that I can say is good to know. So these are the topics that you should focus on when you are studying ear. Okay. Now let's understand what are the topics that you will study for pharynx. Now in pharynx, definitely anatomy of the pharynx is very very high yield. They can ask you anything from anatomy. They can ask you what is sinus of Morgagni, structures of passing through sinus of Morgagni, what is Zenker's diverticulum, what is Killian's dehiscence, what are these structures? These are something that you can expect to be asked in the examination. Then mesopharyngeal angiofibroma and carcinoma also are very 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 important topics. This is like a always there question. Like you cannot go to the exam without studying these two topics. You will get for sure one question from angiofibroma and carcinoma. They can give you a clinical image of Hallman Miller sign. They can give you a clinical image of fossa of Rosenmuller asking what is this site. and asking you what is this most commonly the site for origin of which carcinoma they can ask you association of carcinoma with epstein barr virus what is the screening antigen what is the uh, follow up antigen or recovery antigen all of this can be asked there can be multiple questions that can come so these two topics are definitely something that you should go to the exam hall and without reading this it's impossible to get those two marks questions so please remember these are definitely must 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 to 100 times million times till the universe times you have to do these topics before you go to the exam similarly the bread butter of ent is tonsillitis and adenoiditis so you can expect to have a lot of questions coming in from tonsillitis and adenoiditis okay spaces around the pharynx like typically the parapharyngeal space retropharyngeal space prevertebral space these are something that you should know for sure are and the location what are the structures medially laterally if you have to approach these spaces what are the structures at risk so this is something that you will have to do whenever you are talking about pharynx now coming to abscesses retropharyngeal prevertebral abscess how to differentiate so whenever they give you a image of the pharyngeal wall bulge if there is a midline bulge of the pharynx what is it if there is a bulge on the side of the midline what is the diagnosis if there is a unilateral bulge of the tonsil what is the diagnosis so these three are very very important midline bulge is usually suggestive of a prevertebral abscess if there is a bulge on the side of the midline this is suggestive of a retropharyngeal abscess and if you have a unilateral bulge of the tonsil there can be two differential diagnoses it can be either peritonsillar abscess or either it can be parapharyngeal abscess okay so peritonsillar abscess or it can be parapharyngeal abscess if there is a neck swelling it has a parapharyngeal if there is no neck swelling then it is peritonsillar so unilateral bulge with neck swelling is parapharyngeal unilateral bulge without neck swelling is peritonsillar abscess so those are important topics from your pharynx so you understood ear what you should study pharynx what you should study now let us see what you are going to study from larynx so typically anatomy image based questions will come from anatomy asking you to identify the cartilages of the larynx identifying the membranes of the larynx the spaces of the larynx the pre and the paraglottic space they can ask you about the vocalis muscle posterior cricoarytenoid muscle which is the only tensor of the vocal cord which is the only 
ियलिंग <coughs> rest of it even if you don't know it's still okay but at least see a larynx tnm classification i have made it very simple i have given shortcuts many a times during my classes so this is something that you should know for sure in your exams then laryngeal papillomas definitely you should know about recurrent respiratory papillomatosis rrp where you can have questions coming for sure they can give you an ibq they can ask you which hpv is involved 611 or other hpvs what, what is the mode of infection whether vaginal birth or sexual transmission they can ask you recurrence where they ask you pre malignant all of this can be questions from papilloma they can ask you about congenital lesions of the larynx specifically laryngomalacia is a chapter where you can have lot of questions coming in and we have seen time and again these questions are asked they can also ask you about the you know vocal cord uh, you know web laryngeal web they can ask you about subglottic stenosis and they can also ask you about subglottic hemangioma so these are all very important topics that you should definitely know then you should know about voice disorders like vocal nodule vocal cyst what are they, what they produce they should know about speech disorders like uh, dysphonia plica ventricularis spasmodic dysphonia all of that now again croup and epiglottitis is something that is a favorite of the examiner so you cannot go to the exam hall without knowing the favorites so there is again a very important comparison table how to identify a clinical scenario of croup how to identify a clinical scenario of epiglottitis they will ask you radiological sign typically the thumb sign and they can ask you about your steeple sign so this is something that is very very important that you should know tb larynx again a important topic where they can ask you what is the first sign which is hyperemia they can ask you what are the different names that you see here mammillated arytenoids mouth mouth bitten appearance rat bitten appearance turban epiglottis all of this can be asked now we finished ear we understood pharynx larynx so we are left with nose that you should definitely know so uh, if you know these important topics in your hand and if you have prepared these topics in your hand i'm sure ent will become a cake walk for you you will be able to answer almost all the questions that come from ent because these are topics that definitely are a must know for your exams <clears throat> okay then you will have anatomy and physiology as most important thing because they have asked in the last fmg about the external nose bony part is how much cartilaginous part is how much bony part is constituted of how many paired bones how many unpaired bones how many paired cartilages how many unpaired cartilages so that's a very important question they can ask you questions on epistaxis they can ask you about the circulation the ica territory gives off to what branches eca territory gives off to what branches what is littles area what is woodruff's area what happens in anterior epistaxis what are the causes of posterior epistaxis in general bleeding disorders disorders of liver disorders of kidney disorders of blood vessels like hhd hereditary hemorrhagic telangiectasia yeah, all of these are very very important topic and this is definitely a must 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 know for all of you you should know the protocol for the management of epistaxis which is trotter's method then you should be initial medical review and resuscitation prepare for nasal endoscopy if single bleeding point is there you will cauterize if you see multiple bleeding points you are going to pack the nose and if you do anterior nasal packing if it fail you do ligation of arteries 
what is the first artery that you like it spinopalatine which is artery of epistaxis then you are going to ligate your internal maxillary artery and followed by external carotid and ethmoidal artery usually from case to case situation so epistaxis is definitely something that you should work on very strongly and solve the questions diseases of sinuses sinusitis rhinitis they are very easy something that you will know dns is very important now rhinosporidiosis and rhinoscleroma are again favorites they do keep coming every now and then in the exam hall so this is something that you cannot go to the exam hall without studying so this is definitely a must know topic for all of you so you have to have to have to do this rhinosporidiosis and rhinoscleroma they have asked you multiple times questions on this last fmg again we had questions on inverted papilloma is it benign is it locally invasive is it benign malignant so these questions different names for inverted papilloma how do you manage and treat it all of this is very very important now when we come to classification and prognostic lines of carcinoma you should know definitely about own grens line and you should know about Liederman's classification. So these are something that you cannot go again to the exam hall because these are the two questions that can come. Now surgery is definitely they can expect you to know little bit about septoplasty, little bit about SMR, what is functional endoscopic sinus surgery, what is Weber Ferguson incision, what is Lynch Howarth incision. These two are something that you should know for sure from the surgery and incisions perspective. Recent advances, of course, they can ask you endoscopes and ana endoscopic anatomy of the sinuses. This is something, you know, surgeries and beyond sinus that is good to know. I won't say must know. Okay, so that uh, completes your understanding of what are the topics that you should definitely, definitely, definitely know for your examination. Now, let us do some of the must know images for your class classes. Okay. So what is something that you should go to the exam hall and this is something that you should for, uh, for your exams. Hello, Dr. Besla. So can you tell me what is the diagnosis that you see here? Tympanic membrane is red, it is congested, it looks like the blood vessels are radiating from the periphery to the center. There is a bleb, you know, there is a bulging tympanic membrane. What do you think is the diagnosis over here? I am waiting for your answers in the chat box. So first of all, when you see the image, you should know what is happening to the tympanic membrane. The tympanic membrane is congested. It is red. You can see a small area which is bulging. You can also see there is a cartwheel appearance. So when you have all of this, when you have all of this, what will your diagnosis be? So whenever it is congested, red, bulging, you think about only an infective pathology, a saturative pathology. Here when we know there is cartwheel appearance, our diagnosis straight jumps to ASOM, which is acute saturative otitis media. So acute saturative otitis media, as the name suggests, it is acute in onset, which means the disease is less, of four, less than four weeks in duration. Saturative meaning there is pus, otitis media, pus in the middle ear. So acute saturative otitis media is a condition where there is an acute onset of pus in the middle ear. This is most commonly caused by streptococcus. There are four stages. Stage of tubal occlusion, stage of pre-saturation, stage of saturation and stage of resolution. Now in the stage of pre-saturation, you will see this appearance which we call it as cartwheel appearance. So the presence of cartwheel appearance will push you to the diagnosis of acute saturative otitis media. Now, of course, ASOM is an infective acute condition, so no investigations are required for the diagnosis of it. You are going to treat it with antibiotics. Even after giving antibiotics, nasal decongestant, so if it persists, or if there is an excruciating ear pain with bulging drum, if there is incomplete resolution or persistent effusion beyond 12 weeks, 
then you are going to do a surgery and that surgery that you do for patients for asom is called as myringotomy so myringotomy is usually done in the posterior inferior quadrant and a curvy linear incision is given in the posterior inferior quadrant so that is about asom now let's go to the second image now looking at the image can you all tell me what is the diagnosis here in the image what is it that you are able to see and appreciate here Okay, so the video is getting stuck. I understand, but I think it will be fine. Let's just give it one minute intermittently, one or two minutes, it will lag, and then the rest of it will be fine. So just give it one or two minutes in between, it will be fine. Okay. Okay, Dr. Besla. Okay, so can you tell me what is this finding that you see here? What is this? In PARS tensor, there is a specific finding that you see. What is this finding? So, what you see is a subtotal perforation. So, here what you see is a subtotal perforation. Okay, so what is a subtotal perforation? Whenever the perforation or the hole that is there in the tympanic membrane includes all the quadrant except annulus so there is perforation in all the quadrants except what except annulus so it is pairing the annulus so whenever the annulus is paired and there is a perforation in the past tensor we call it as a subtotal perforation okay now what are the structures that you see through the perforation meaning there is a hole so through the perforation we are able to see some structures what are those structures First of all, the structure that you see here, this number one. Can you all tell me what is this structure number one? Behind that, there is another structure which is articulating probably with the head of stapes, which is going like this. What is this? What is two? What is three? What is this tendon coming from pyramid? <coughs> which is going to be your four so tell me quickly what do you think is one what is two what is three what is four very good campylobacter very good gyri one is the handle of malleus okay so what is one one is nothing but your handle of malleus now malleus is the first ossicle having head the neck short process and the handle or the long process this handle of malleus is attached to the tympanic membrane so what you see is the tympanic membrane okay then you see the second structure what is this second structure that you see here this second structure is nothing but the long process of the incus okay so very good that is the long process of the incus very good campylobacter it goes and articulates with the head of stapes so three is your head of stapes this stapes goes and fits on a window called as the oval window okay then you have got a tendon here going to the neck this tendon is nothing but your stapedial tendon <clears throat> so what is this tendon this tendon is your stapedial tendon okay then the the foot plate of the stapes goes on a window which is oval window so what is this window below this is going to be your round window so posterior quadrant so this entire longer is your posterior malleolar fold and this quadrants below it is going to be your posterior quadrant so in the posterior superior quadrant you will see the ossicles posterior inferior quadrant you will see the round window Anterior inferior quadrant, you are going to see the opening of eustachian tube. In the middle, there is a bulge. This is by the promontory formed by the basal turn of cochlea. So, all of these structures you should be able to recognize. Now, when we see the edges of perforation, they seem like it is a non healing perforation. So, whenever you have a non healing perforation of pars tensa, So non-healing perforation of pars tensa 
it will come in tubotympanic disease or an aticoandral type of a disease it is a tubotympanic type of csom in aticoandral type of csom you will see a perforation in the pars flaccida not in the pars tensa okay so retraction and perforation here in the pars flaccida will be suggestive to you of aticoandral disease whereas if there is a disease of pars tensa it should be suggestive to you of a tubotympanic type of disease so when you see this image you should know what is the diagnosis you should know what is the clinical finding you should be able to identify the structures that you see through the perforation and having said that how will you manage this of course you are going to do a hrct temporal bone and the paranasal sinuses because you want to see the ear and you want to see the pns and the nose because of nose has this perforation occurred treatment will be to treat the primary cause first the primary cause is usually in the nose or the nasopharynx so you will treat that first and then do a reconstruction of the drum and the middle ear which we call it as tympanoplasty with or without mastoidectomy so depending upon the hrct findings the treatment will vary okay so this is about the finding now again a question that you should always always know so when we see perforation in a pars tensa <coughs> So, whenever we see perforations in pars tensa, we th talk about tubotympanic. Perforation in pars flaccida, we talk about aticoantral. But here we are talking of multiple perforations. So, whenever we are talking about multiple perforations, there has to be one diagnosis that you should know. There is not one perforation, but there are two, three perforations. So, whenever you have multiple perforations, what should your diagnosis be? Yes, multiple perforation is suggestive to you of tuberculous otitis media. So, TBOM, tuberculous otitis media presents to you with multiple perforation, with pale granulation, Presenting to you with hearing loss which is disproportionate to the findings that you see on examination. These are all features of TBOM. Definitely diagnosis is established by AFB stain and culture and histopathological examination. And the treatment of this will definitely be give. You will have to repair the middle ear and the tympanic membrane which we call it as tympanoplasty with or without mastoidectomy but you will have to club it with ATT. So you will have to give anti-tuberculous therapy for the treatment of tuberculous otitis media. Okay, let's go to the next question or the next image. Now, what is it that you see in the image? There is some specific finding. Do you see some air bubbles like this? So what do these air bubbles behind the tympanic membrane tell you? What is the story of this? So air bubbles behind the tympanic membrane and see there is a fluid level below and there is an air level above. So whenever you get air bubbles and whenever you get an air fluid level, there is something that you should know for sure. What are we talking about? The presence of air bubbles, presence of air fluid level should tell you some diagnosis for sure. What is that diagnosis? <clears throat> no campylobacter it is not myringitis bullosa or myringitis this here see whenever we say itis it means inflammation do you see any redness in the tympanic membrane no there is no redness so whenever there is no redness any infective pathology you will think of or a non-infective pathology you will think of so first of all you will think of non-infective pathology so in the middle ear disease is asom infective or som infective which amongst the two is a non-infective pathology very very good it is serous otitis media so whenever you get this picture of air bubbles and air fluid level there is one thing that should strikingly come to your brain and that one thing that should strikingly come to your brain is serous otitis media which is also called as non-saturative otitis media, which is also called as blue ear, which is also called as secretory otitis media. So there are multiple names given for same condition. But how do you establish? See, there are many findings that you see in SOM. It can be 
dull it can be thick it can be thin there can be loss of cone of light there can be decreased mobility all of these findings can be there but the diagnostic hallmark for som is going to be presence of air bubbles and air fluid levels so whenever you have air bubbles and air fluid level behind the tympanic membrane you must think about one condition which is serous otitis media how do you diagnose this definitely you will have to get a tympanogram done so on a tympanogram if you see a d type of a graph so on tympanogram if you have a b type of a graph then what will you do you will do myringotomy and put a grome which is a ventilating tube so myringotomy with a grome insertion is done for patients with serous otitis media okay so this is the treatment of SOM. So initially wait and watch you will do for three months. Beyond that if it persists then myringotomy and grome. Myringotomy is done in the antero inferior quadrant and a radial incision is given. Through this you will put a ventilating tube that goes to the middle ear which is called as a grome. Grome will fall by itself by the end of three to four uh, months or max by six months. If it doesn't then you can remove it. Okay. Let's go to the next image. So you see it's very importantly there is a whitish mass behind an intact tympanic membrane. So there is a whitish mass behind the tympanic membrane. They are telling to you that there is no history of ear disease, no history of any ear discharge, no history of any ear pain nothing everything is negative only positive finding is whitish mass behind an intact tympanic membrane this usually you will see between the age of 9 to 13 years of age presenting to you with gradually progressive conductive hearing loss this happens whenever the cells of the cleft get entrapped into the pouch of the middle ear so what am i talking about Okay, I'll give you a clue. This is diagnosed by a criteria which is called as Levinson's criteria for congenital, sorry, Levinson's criteria. What is this used for? Good, Campylobacter, you're right, but you have to tell the specific diagnosis. That specific diagnosis is congenital cholesteatoma. So, congenital cholesteatoma presents with whitish mass behind an intact tympanic membrane, no prior history of ear disease, no prior history of any ear surgery, no prior history of any otological diseases, everything else is negative. The only positive finding is a whitish mass behind an intact tympanic membrane. This is about congenital cholesteatoma. Now, look at this image and tell me your diagnosis. So, you specifically have the disease in the pars tensa. Or do you have the disease in the pars flaccida? So where is the disease? Tensa or flaccida? There is a whitish mass of keratin. And you don't see perforation or a hole. But maybe there is a retraction. Inside that retraction there is a whitish mass of keratin. So what do you think is the diagnosis here? Whenever there is a whitish mass of keratin. Specifically in the pars flaccida. It should prompt you to a very, very important diagnosis. What diagnosis are we talking about? Yes, I am waiting for your answers. Yes, Gayatri, Campylobacter, Besla, Par Paras Patel. Come on, quickly answer. Is this congenital or acquired? If it is acquired, is it primary or secondary? That the, These are the questions that I want to know from all of you. Okay, definitely this is going to be a cholesteatoma where you have a whitish mass of keratin. Now tell me, is this congenital or acquired? Do you see, uh, you know, whitish mass behind the tympanic membrane or a whitish keratin in the past flaccida? So this cannot be congenital. This has to be an acquired cholesteatoma. Acquired cholesteatoma, primary and secondary. These are the two classifications. Primary is a condition where there is no abnormality of the tympanic membrane. So there is no perforation, there is no retraction. Whereas secondary is a condition where you have got there is an abnormality of tympanic membrane like a perforation or a retraction. 
okay so here you see retraction and there is a polystatoma so this is an acquired secondary form of polystatoma <coughs> what is essentially meaning of polystatoma polystatoma essentially means skin in wrong place what is skin in wrong place whenever you have got stratified squamous epithelium in the middle ear so whenever you have stratified squamous epithelium in the middle ear we call that condition as polystatoma so the presence of stratified squamous epithelium in the middle ear is suggestive to you of a polystate normally middle ear should have cuboidal epithelium but if we have a stratified squamous epithelium then we say there is polystatoma okay now look at this and give me your diagnosis there is a flamingo pink appearance behind the promontory seen through an intact tympanic membrane what is this sign and where do you see this so flamingo pink appearance of the promontory seen through a tympanic membrane this sign is called as very good everyone short sign and short sign is suggestive to you of a disease which we call it as otosclerosis so whenever a short sign is positive what is your inference is this a active focus or an inactive focus so whenever a short sign is positive it is an active disease or there is active deposition of uh, you know otosclerosis happening over there right now so whenever there is an active focus you can still give sodium fluoride to prevent further progression of the disease but if short sign is negative it means that it is an inactive focus and when the focus is inactive there is no role of sodium fluoride sodium fluoride is only given to prevent further progression but it cannot cause reversal of the disease or cannot revert back the disease so whenever a short sign is positive you should see that this is an active focus yes uh, campylobacter otosclerosis is an autosomal dominant condition with incomplete penetrance seen in 30 to 40 years of age group increases following pregnancy after menopause very importantly measles has been implicated as a triggering agent now we don't know why but all those who are non immunized with mmr or have undergone this infection with measles they have a possibility of having this um, otosclerosis in them now otosclerosis is again diagnosed with history clinical examination but tympanogram will show you typically as type of a graph so if you get an as type of a tympanogram you must think about um, otosclerosis now again how do you treat it the treatment of otosclerosis is going to be either with hearing aid to amplify the hearing or if they want if there is an active focus sodium fluoride can be given to prevent further progression but it cannot reverse back the disease and uh, if the patient is not requiring hear, willing for a hearing aid or does not want sodium fluoride then the treatment is stepidectomy or stepidotomy with placement of prosthesis okay now let's go to the next image showing you something behind the tympanic membrane a reddish mass behind the tympanic membrane what is your diagnosis yes i am waiting for your answers there is a little lag between when i am telling you to what time you people are responding i'm just going to wait till you respond so this sun this appearance is called as rising sun appearance So rising sun appearance there is a red mass behind the tympanic membrane probably coming from the floor of the middle ear what do you think is the diagnosis very very good so this appearance rising sun appearance or sunset appearance is diagnostic of a particular condition which we call it as glomus tumor here we thinking of glomus jugular because it is seeming to come from the floor of the middle ear here we see this sign called as the rising sun appearance now when you put pressure in the external auditory canal and when you increase the pressure the pressure gets transmitted to the middle ear and the tumor vibrates vigorously and becomes pale that sign is called as brown sign so brown sign is a sign that you see in glomus where the tumor vibrates vigorously on increasing the pressure in the external auditory canal so rising sun appearance and brown sign then you have got another sign which you see on a ct scan which is called as the felt sign 
so erosion of the bone between the carotid and jugular is called as phelps sign so again you will have question on phelps sign what is phelps sign can be asked mri typically shows you a salt and pepper appearance angiography in a patient with glomus will show you the feeding vessel which is usually the ascending pharyngeal artery you will do angiography not to identify the feeding vessel but also to embolize it so once you embolize it the tumor becomes less vascular and then you are going to treat it by doing surgery so surgery followed by embolization followed by surgical excision will be the treatment very importantly biopsy fnac probe test all of these are contraindicated in patients with glomus tube. Okay. Now, like, look at this and tell me what is your diagnosis. There are vesicles in the area of distribution of the facial nerve. There is an element type of facial palsy. Also, that I can tell you that the eighth nerve is involved. So, what is your diagnosis with all the clinical findings that you see? Vesicles unilateral deviation of the angle of mouth facial element type of facial palsy eighth nerve palsy you should think about a syndrome which is nowadays called as the justin bieber syndrome because he's had this infection what is this yes very good this is called as ramsey hunt syndrome also called as herpes zoster oticus this herpes zoster virus initially when it gets infected it goes and remains latent in the geniculate ganglion which ganglion geniculate ganglion now whenever there is a reactivation of the virus what happens is there is lesions in the area of the distribution of the seventh nerve in the area of seventh nerve and eighth nerve travel very close to each other so there is an inflammation of the eighth nerve resulting in sensory neural hearing loss and there is an element type of facial palsy now here you will have to give antivirals usually acyclovir or valcyclovir are the drug of choice along with that steroids and in and along with that supportive therapy is given for patients with herpes osteoroticus does it have a good prognosis like bell's palsy no it does not have a good prognosis if there is a bad prognosis in patients with herpes osteoroticus bell's palsy definitely has a very very good prognosis okay now look at this and tell me what is your diagnosis yes i'm waiting for all of your answers there's something that you see specifically whitish discharge with blackish spots presenting to you with mainly itching what should you think of a repeat question a common question this is the external auditory canal where you see the lesion that tympanic membrane is inside you see there is a whitish mass with blackish spores what should come to your mind whenever you see this typically presenting to you with itching typically presenting to you after um, you know uh, after taking a bath or after having gone to swimming what is your diagnosis One second, my pen tab has got disconnected. Yeah. Yes, very good. Campylobacter and paraspatel. This is very specific for otomycosis. Otomycosis is a fungal infection. Most common organism responsible for causing otomycosis is aspergillus. Aspergillus followed by candida. So, first most common is aspergillus this is followed by candida now typically black spores should tell you the diagnosis of otomycosis or if the history is telling you itching this has to prompt you to the diagnosis of otomycosis okay now otomycosis even though it is a fungal infection does it warrant you to use an antifungal therapy systemic antifungal like an oral or a viral uh, you know iv antifungal no you will give only topical antifungals if the lesions persist or if the organism is aggressive not responding to your medical therapy of topical antibiotics then you can go for oral antifungal uh, sorry oral uh, antifungals or iv antifungals 
okay yes it has a wet newspaper like appearance gayatri that is the name given for aspergillus for candida you have a curdy white discharge so these are specific names that you give get along with the organisms that are tanked along okay so i hope this is clear to everybody okay now look at this image and tell me your diagnosis you see the tonsil on one side is in the tonsillar fossa opposite side it is almost coming and touching to the uvula so whenever you have a unilateral enlargement of the tonsil what are your two differential diagnoses what are the two differential diagnoses you will consider whenever there is a unilateral enlargement of the tonsil i have already told you while discussing the must know topics you should think about two conditions what are those two conditions i'm waiting for your answers very good paraspatel one is peritonsillar abscess agreed one is peritonsillar abscess which is also called as quincy what is the second differential diagnosis whenever there is a unilateral bulge of the tonsil the second one is a parapharyngeal abscess now peritonsillar abscess will not have any neck swelling in the upper third of the sternocleidomastoid muscle whereas parapharyngeal abscess will have a neck swelling present okay so whenever there is a unilateral enlargement of the tonsil look at the image if it is showing neck swelling it is peritonsil uh, if it is neck swelling the answer will be parapharyngeal abscess no neck swelling then it is going to be your peritonsillar abscess okay now you see this is an image showing to you there is a this is your midline and there is a pharyngeal wall bulge on the side of the midline so what do you think is the diagnosis good rushikesh now can you tell me what is the diagnosis here there is a pharyngeal posterior pharyngeal wall this entire wall is your posterior pharyngeal wall and if i take this as the midline the bulge is on the side of the midline so whenever you get a pharyngeal wall bulge on the side of the midline what should your diagnosis be should it be prevertebral abscess or should it be retropharyngeal abscess no campylobacter see whenever there is a pharyngeal pouch or a zancus diverticulum it will present as a neck swelling not a posterior pharyngeal wall bulge on the neck you will see the swelling <coughs> so whenever you see a bulge on the side of the midline very good paras patel the answer should be retropharyngeal abscess because retropharyngeal space lies on the side of midline it is not a midline space prevertebral space is a midline space whereas retropharyngeal space is a space that you see on either side of the midline so if there is an abscess in the retropharyngeal space it will produce a bulge to you on the either side of midline prevertebral space abscess will typically presents to you with a bulge in the midline so on the side of the midline your answer will be retropharyngeal abscess if it is a midline bulge then it is going to be your prevertebral abscess now you see this there is a pharyngeal wall bulge exactly in the midline so there is a midline swelling of the posterior pharyngeal wall what do you think is the diagnosis here yes i'm waiting for your answers what is your, what do you think is the diagnosis here if you see a midline bulge in the pharyngeal wall <coughs> okay paras can you tell me now what is the diagnosis very good very very good the diagnosis now will be prevertebral abscess so i hope everyone has understood now so midline bulge the answer will be prevertebral abscess if there is a bulge on either side of the midline like this 
then you will think of a retropharyngeal abscess. If there is a tonsillar bulge, then you are going to think of two differential diagnoses. Either a peritonsillar abscess which you call it as quincy or parapharyngeal abscess. In peritonsillar abscess, there is no neck swelling. In parapharyngeal abscess, there is a neck swelling. So now any pharyngeal wall bulge that is given, will you be able to identify and recognize? Yes, hopefully yes. Good. Now look at this question, a common repeat that you see. There is some lesion on the external nose and this happens due to hypertrophy of the sebaceous glands especially in patients with acne rosacea or in elderly or in diabetes. It is not a pre-malignant condition and this requires if the patient wants you know this to get rid of the region laser resurfacing and along with that you have to do a skin grafting. What is this lesion? Good everyone good this is called as rhinophyma also called as potato nose. So rhinophyma or potato nose happens due to yes sebaceous glands hypertrophy in patients with acne rosacea. Okay, now tell me what is your clinical diagnosis. A nasal speculum has been inserted into the vestibule of the nose and you are seeing this is the area of your columella. Behind the columella you should be able to see the septum. Do you see there is a bend in the septum? So what do you see? What is your diagnosis when the septum is not straight and it is bent? What do we call it as? Yes, I am waiting for your answers. When the septum is not straight and if it is bent, what do we call it as? So septal hematoma campylobacter will produce to you a bulge on either side of the septum. So if I take the septum in the midline, you will see a swelling on either side of septum in a septal hematoma. So in a hematoma, you will see there is a bulge bilaterally, not unilaterally. But if you see a bulge unilaterally and the bulge of the septum is because it is not straight and it has got kinked and bent, what will you call it as? Very good, Paraspatel, Rachna. This is an image showing to you deviated nasal septum. So normally the septum will divide the nasal cavities into two halves. If it is bent like this, then we call it as deviated nasal septum. Now a deviated nasal septum and if the patient has symptoms like nasal obstruction, difficulty in breathing, difficulty in smell, or external nasal deformity, recurrent middle ear infections, if there are any of these symptoms that the patient is suffering from not being treated by not getting reduced with medical therapy, then it warrants a surgery. So DNS plus symptoms is an indication for surgery. And what surgery will you do? The surgery that you will do will be septoplasty or SMR. So in septoplasty, incision is given only on one side of the septum, mucosa is elevated only on one side, then the deviated portion is also removed only from that side and then the flap is repositioned. That is a conservative surgery which is septoplasty. Whereas if you give incision on both the sides of the septum, elevate the mucosa on both the sides, remove near complete cartilage and bone and reposition the flap, that is called as SMR. So septoplasty is more conservative, SMR is more radical. Okay, now let's go to the next image and identify the structures. Can you tell me what is 1 and what is 2? Of course, septum has been marked. So, in the middle, you are able to see the septum. What is 1 and what is 2? On the lateral wall, you see there are some projections. What are these projections? Yes, can you tell me what is 1, what is 2? So basically, no, that's not a nasal polyp, campylobacter and uh, parus. So when we take the nasal cavity, there are 6 walls, but basically I'll discuss with you the 2 walls. This is your medial wall, which is formed by the septum. And this is your lateral wall. In the lateral wall of the nose, there are three bony projections which are called as turbinate or concha. So 
so we have inferior turbinate we have middle turbinate and we have superior turbinate what you see here this is your inferior turbinate what you see too is your middle turbinate this space below the inferior turbinate is called as inferior meatus inferior meatus receives the opening of a duct can you tell me what duct opens in the inferior meatus of the nose nasolacrimal duct okay then you have middle meatus middle meatus receives the opening of anterior group of sinuses the anterior group of sinuses are frontal maxillary and anterior ethmoid so these are your anterior group of sinuses which open in the middle meatus in the superior meatus the space below the superior turbinate is called as superior meatus so the superior meatus receives the opening of posterior ethmoidal air cells and the sphenoid sinus drains into a recess which is called as sphenoethmoidal recess okay so this is about the structures opening into each wall now a very high yield question which they will ask you this is an image of the nasopharynx so tell me what is this structure 1 what is this structure 2 and what is this structure 3 very importantly this you should be able to recognize so what is 1 what is 2 what is 3 i'm waiting for your answers so what is 1 what is 2 what is 3 so 1 is definitely going to be the opening of eustachian tube okay so gayatri campylobacter just see this area that you see this is the opening of eustachian tube now this is covered by a cushion like this this bulge that you see no this is a cushion this cushion is called as torus tuberius okay so what is it called as torus tuberius it is formed by the salpingo pharyngeus muscle now don't have to remember that this entire thing is called as torus tuberius behind this you see there is a depression this depression that you see behind it this is called as fossa of rosenmuller so what is 3 3 is your fossa of rosenmuller so now you get it what is eustachian tubule opening what is torus tuberius and what is fossa of rosenmuller everyone yes so fossa of rosenmuller is the most common site for origin for nasopharyngeal carcinoma if you see some mass in the midline of the nasopharynx you should think it is an adenoidal mass most commonly if it is a cystic mass then it can be a thonvoid cyst okay so these two masses are there in the uh, nasopharynx in the midline okay campylobacter nasopharyngeal carcinoma arises from fossa of rosen okay <clears throat> let's go to the next question so this is the posterior end of the nose you see a red vascular mass so a red vascular mass in the posterior end of nose especially seen sorry there's something that happened okay so red vascular mass in the posterior end of the nose seen in juveniles seen in males dependent on testosterone in its for its growth presenting to you with bleeding presenting to you with uh, epistaxis cranial nerve palsy which is the most common benign lesion of the nasopharynx what are we talking about campylobacter not hemangioma we are talking about juvenile nasopharyngeal angiofibroma So since the nasopharynx is the posterior end of the nose 
So in the nasopharynx, if you get a red vascular mass, especially if they have told you juvenile, especially if they have told you males, you will think about juvenile nasopharyngeal angiofibro. Okay? Great. Now look at this image. The epiglottis has got folded upon itself. So when the epiglottis has got folded upon itself, a congenital lesion of the larynx. What is this most common congenital lesion of the larynx which presents to you with this kind of epiglottis which is folded upon itself? What is this called as? Yes, this is called as omega shaped epiglottis and this omega shaped epiglottis is seen in one condition which is called as laryngomalacia. Laryngomalacia is the most common congenital anomaly of the larynx. So with this, I finish the first set of discussion with all of you regarding the must know images. If there is any doubt or there is any question, do let me know in the chat box or in the comment section below so that I shall be able to address all your queries. So if there is anything else that you would want from my end for your preparation and if you want me to take classes on those particular topics or those particular questions, do let me know in the comment section. I shall come up with those classes very soon on the YouTube channel or on the Unacademy special classes which are again free classes. So if you want to make utilization of us without having to pay, do let us know. Yes, so thank you everyone. Thank you for joining in for the class. Take care. God bless. Bye-bye.